and I remember I was walking down to the school of business to attend a class, and that's when the first plane hit. I had a very strange feeling. My hus I called home and asked my husband, is there something going on? And he called back right away. I was in the jetway, and he said, they just hit the second tower. I tried calling family and friends and could not get through it at all. And this nightmare was real. I mean, the towers really had collapsed and the Pentagon really was on fire. A portion of the Pentagon has collapsed as a result. I was in front of the TV and I could see what's going on. I said, I'm going to work. Hundreds of miles away from the Big Apple and the nation's capital, these Minnesota strangers are meeting for the first time. A military commander, medical examiner, flight attendant, firefighter, educator, and mental health professional, each here reflecting on September 11, 2001. I didn't realize the impact that that day had on me, um, the emotional toll, until several years later. The devastation that I saw as a firefighter, you know, this is what we train to do. Um, I don't think there was anyone that was prepared that day for the task that was at hand. In 2001, Brooklyn Park Fire Chief John Cunningham was a college student and volunteer firefighter in Connecticut. He traveled to New York to help search for survivors at the World Trade Center. How many lives were saved and how many were lost? We simply don't know. New York City is always hustling and bustling that you can, you can hardly hear yourself think. And I just vividly remember the silence did. And I remember um, the large rotunda and, and those iconic things that, that you saw and the restaurant that was there. And that was on the ground. There wasn't hardly anything that I resembled other than bits and pieces of these towering skyscrapers that, that now were reduced to rubble in, in front of me. And I knew in that rubble there were people. Um, and we had to do whatever we could. The two towers of the World Trade Center are down, destroyed. Please start walking towards the east side. Come on. Yo, come on, keep moving. You know, as a scientist and a physician, you know going into an operation like this that, that perfection is not going to be possible. Dr. Andrew Baker is Hennepin County's medical examiner, but in 2001, he was a member of the U.S. Air Force called to help identify the victims killed when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. You've got thousands of fragmented parts of, of human bodies that you're trying to reassemble into 189 identities. Though he and his team were able to bring some closure to 184 families. It still bothers me that we couldn't identify those five individuals. And I, and I know one of those individuals was the three-year-old who was on board Flight 77. A father himself, the weight of the work was real. Of the eight children that were killed on 9-11, five of them were on board American Airlines Flight 77. And at some point, all five of their remains had to have passed through my hands during the operation. And I think about those five kids every day. They would be in their 20s or early 30s now. We had been preparing for that kind of a mission for most of our, our careers. Now retired Brigadier General Tim Kosalter served as commander of the 148th Fighter Wing based in Duluth. Shutting down the air traffic control, taking control of skies, providing combat air patrols, preventing any movement of airplanes uh, or aerial threats. Um, that was in our, you might say, in our DNA by then. Within hours of an overnight training session, my wife said an airplane ran into the, flew into the Twin Towers. His unit received orders. The president's airplane was heading towards the Midwest, and so we launched two airplanes to intercept that airplane. Uh, fortunately, a couple other airplanes had got to him before we did, uh, and then took him to Washington. We were in an area uh, at a time in history when the threat from something coming by air had been diminished over the last 40 years, since the 50s. And so the mentality wasn't quite there. We missed that as a military, but we didn't internalize it and think about how could, how could that be utilized. And so it was a failure of imagination in many respects. By the end of 2003, we had, from Duluth, we had flown the most hours and sorties of any other unit. And it, it was just, that's what we do, and that's, we were asked to do it, and that's what we did. We were uh, on a flight. Uh, 757 heading for San Francisco and we always as flight attendants you have to be on the plane an hour before departure and uh, nothing was happening I mean no, we were getting later and later and the agents weren't saying anything we had no pilot 
Flight attendant Cassie Reince was scheduled to leave Minneapolis at 9.30 in the morning when she learned the news. We gathered our things, got off the plane, got into the gate area, and it was just chaotic. I mean, everything said cancel, cancel, canceled. Um, all the TVs are off. She says all flights were grounded. Thousands of flight attendants were placed on reserve. People were all over screaming at the agents and this one man in particular, he's like, what do you mean? I can't go to New York. I was there yesterday. That was such a feeling of helplessness for me, not knowing if they were safe or what was happening. Dr. Stanley Brown is from Harlem, New York and a longtime educator in the Twin Cities. He was working in downtown Minneapolis on September 11th. Someone in the office said that a plane went into the tower. And I said to myself, oh, there you go again, thinking you know everything. No way a plane could have. The building came just rumbling down. It was like, like a war zone. It was a a few hours, if not days, that I could could not get in touch with, with family and friends. And my college lost, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of, of people that worked in the towers. And, and, it, and that's, the, that's the worst thing, knowing that guys like me and you who have families, they're not going to see them anymore. So... That's the hardest thing. A study suggests that individuals who lived in Manhattan or around the blast zone have equivalent PTSD rates to uh, military vets who saw active combat duty. Dr. Joshua Zimmerman is an adult psychiatrist with Health Partners. When asked what people should take away from this conversation, he shared this. I think what I would want my daughter to learn from this discussion and from 9-11 is assume everyone has some trauma and be kind, don't judge people for what they're doing or how they're acting. Don't be afraid to ask people how they're doing and really listen when they answer. As we approach September 11th, what, what are you thinking about as we come upon 20 years? I hope my peers have learned from my experience. Dr. Baker shared his story with professional groups, but he's speaking publicly for the first time in this space. It took many years before I could talk about it at all. His deployment lasted three weeks during 9-11. The impact of 9-11 will last a lifetime. I got one day of leave during the 9-11 operation and it happened to be the night of the Concert for America in New York City. And so I drove from Dover Air Force Base back to my home in Maryland to watch the concert with my wife and my sons. And I was doing fine until of all things, Paul Simon started singing Bridge Over Troubled Water. Like and I just fell on the floor and I had an uncontrollable meltdown that went on for many, many minutes. I, nothing like that has ever happened to me before. And my wife just had to pull the kids together and hug them and explain, Daddy's got a lot of emotions that he needs to get out. It's okay. He's going to be fine. I, I didn't recognize that that was happening to me at the time until that moment. And to this day, I cannot listen to that song. Your time has gone to shine. I came from Connecticut um, with my best friend and other firefighters, and we met up with FDNY firefighters. Uh, Billy Quick um, was one of the uh, guys that we met up with from FDNY. Billy Quick developed um, health issues at, at a, as a result of working at, at Ground Zero. Um, a contingent of us got together and we all went to go visit him at his house. Um, his health was rapidly deteriorating um, and we wanted to cheer him up. It was a complete surprise. We all showed up. Um, we met Billy um, and spent hours just, just talking to, to him and sharing stories. And, and um, then at, that night we went on our way and I was getting ready to board a, a flight back to Minnesota the next day and I got a call that he passed away. Um, I hold him dear in my heart and every one that I work with um, that day. And I didn't know how to process the things that I was seeing, uh, whether if it was September 11th and responding that day to the tragedies that I saw as a, as a firefighter day in and day out. Chief Cunningham said at one point after September 11th, he stopped showing up for training and became distant from activities he enjoyed.
Someone reached out to me, and I'll never forget it, and said, hey, are you okay? And honestly, John, you don't look very good. You've changed, and what can I do to help? And we want you back. And that was a, a key to me that I'm like, I really needed to, to ground myself again um, and to not be afraid to ask for help uh, and that self-reflection. And honestly, it was that, that phone call that day that was what I needed um, a few years a after September 11th to realize uh, this is my passion. I think as a society, we have to move from assuming that everyone is always okay. And I think this helps people see trauma is common. Everyone has reactions to it, and it's okay to talk about. I think we saw a lot of racism come out of 911. And it was covert and overt. And it was very frightening for me. There was a segment of our society that was, that was absolutely damaged on that day and damaged for years because they were profiled. And, um, and we can't let that go lightly. Our Muslim brothers and sisters were profiled for years after that. And we, we can't let that go. And, and we cannot just overlook that. So I was flying about 34 years at that time, 9-11. And um, you're always told not to profile people. And you always are on guard about doing that. But what I discovered was the passengers started profiling each other. You know, they'd be they'd call you over and they'd say, you know, do you know anything about those people over there or whatever, you know, and you just had to really be on guard. My hope is that we as a society and as a country can come to a place that we are respectful of all races, ethnicities, and cultures. Dr. Brown and others delivered this message on moving forward after September 11. As educational institutions, we have to be ever so mindful to help our scholars navigate a system, navigate a global world that they are able to be successful in. Um, we have a generation today that, that wasn't born then. And the only way that they're going to know is to um, hear firsthand those experiences um, or to, to hear um, those connections that a lot of people do have, uh, even as far away as Minnesota today. When darkness comes and pain is all around. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. You know, I've never thought I'd see this in my entire life, total devastation. Shayla Reeves, WCCO 4 News. Your time has gone.